Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the bridge. <laughs> We're glad you're here today, and uh, as people continue to make their way in, uh, just there's a few where um, we. This is our final week of community groups so if you're in a community group I think you're kind of having a Christmas party if you are like what is a community group now would be a great time to begin asking that question if you've not asked that question before Um, and we'll start our second semester after the new year and uh, so today's uh, sermon passage is on the Ten Commandments and uh, it has been a quite a journey to uh, study those this week, and uh, it's a reminder to be grateful for the grace of God that we experience through Jesus, who uh, once we study those, we realize it's impossible for us to obey and fulfill them, but we have one, the author and perfecter of our faith, who did it and also equips us to do it. So... um, Our call to worship today is going to be Psalm 146, verse 1, and it's very simple. It just says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. And he is the God who is worthy of all our praise. And it is our prayer that as we sing, God may perform a miracle in our hearts and minds and enable us to worship him in spirit and in truth today. So let's stand and sing.
your baby singing out there. We should all be singing as loud as that baby. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So the law that we're going to be learning about today is still valid. And it's still really hard if we try to do it alone. But through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. The, uh, <laughs> the plan that God has set forth for his children is amazing. And it, it's just hard to wrap our minds around the fact that he, is, he knows you by name. He's called you to a greater purpose. He's called you out of the world. And uh, in Galatians chapter 5, it says, You, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if we're honest, it's, it's hard to love. It's hard to love some days, but Christ makes that possible. 
if we'll just have faith in him and the calling that he's put on our lives, we'll start to love like him. God has decided to save my lost soul. God has decided to save my lost soul. God has decided to save my lost soul. No turning back. No turning back. Christ has decided to die in my place. Christ has decided to die in my place. Christ has decided to die in my place. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The Holy Spirit now lives inside me. The Holy Spirit now lives inside me. The Holy Spirit now lives inside me. No turning back, no turning back. Jesus, thy cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. Thy cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Um, at this time, if you have a child newborn through fifth grade, we're going to ask that you go ahead and take them out the back. They're going to head to Children's Church during this time. And if you have any questions, there will be um, teachers out back that can help you out with that. And as we continue in worship this morning, um, let's go ahead and pray for those kids. And then we're going to get a chance to sing uh, ancient words together, which is going to just allow us to thank God for, uh, for this word and for his law, which Stephen's going to talk with us about this morning. So... Let's pray. Father, you are so good. Um, Father, you are uh, just a God of grace and mercy and justice. Uh, and Father, we didn't deserve, uh, Father, to be redeemed, and you redeemed us anyway. Um, God, thank you for that. Father, we pray for these kids this morning as they head back to Children's Church, Father, as they learn about uh, the Ten Commandments and these laws that you've passed down generation after generation. Uh, Father, to give us guidelines how to live, not, um, Father, not so that we would miss out on life, but that we would have life and that we would have it in the fullest. Uh, so God, we just pray that you would open up their hearts this morning. Father, help them to pay attention to their teachers and give their teachers the love that you have uh, for them as well. Um, Father, thank you for your ancient words. Thank you for truth. Thank you for scripture. Father, help us to crave it. Help us to want it. Um, and Father, just grow our love for you this morning and for your word. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, in training and righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Help us grow 
Lord, let that, that, that be our prayer this morning, that your ancient words come into our hearts and uh, move us and change us. God, we are so richly blessed by you. You have given us more than we can ever give back. And you have forgiven us more than we'd like to admit. But we are so thankful. And we now want to offer our voices to you. We want to offer our minds to you. And we want to offer our hearts to you. And as broken as that may seem to us, we know through the lens of your Son, it is pure. And so we thank you. Lord, speak through Stephen as he dives into those ancient words. Send your spirit down on us and down on this place so that we may hear those words and we may hear what you have to say. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. That final song was really a prayer, and the way that I heard you all sing it, um, I know you echo that prayer, that we need these ancient words to come and impart life and hope and joy and purpose and peace and strength. And the amazing thing is that, as I've shared several times, that our hope when we gather together is for God to perform a miracle in your heart and in my heart and in the hearts of, of hearers. The Bible said that we, 
because of our sin nature, are dead. And uh, dead people don't hear very well. Dead people don't talk. Dead people don't move. But that the Spirit of God can bring life where there was once death. And that He's chosen to do that by these ancient words. But as we continue on and, and the reminder of the fact that this is the Advent season, we're going to learn today that on Mount Sinai, God spoke words to Moses that the people heard, laws, words. But if you track the rest of Israel's history, they didn't do so well. And when the last word of the Old Testament was written into the New Testament, there was a 400 year period of silence where there was no inspired word written from God. And then in John chapter 1, the Bible says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this is one of these things where these ancient words have power and have strength, but it, it wasn't enough to save fully that we were always looking to a Savior and Jesus came down to earth to be the Word embodied to show us how to live and to lift us out of our mud and mire and set our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ, His Son. So if you received the Bridge email update, uh, the title of that update this week was called Rules? Question mark? Why? Question mark. And if you're like, what in the world is he talking about? Then I want to encourage you to fill out one of those things and we'll get you on the email update if you're not on it. Um, but I just want you to just kind of think a little bit about rules. We started that way last week also. But why rules? And what we're going to kind of highlight today is that rules actually communicate the heart of the person who's giving them. And, and I want to start with an example because rules often depend on kind of who's giving those rules. And rules sometimes need to be stated, and other times rules are kind of intuitively figured out. And I want you to think about when uh, you were a small child, and you probably had a desire to please mom and dad. I want you to think about as a student in school, the teachers that you really liked, not those you didn't like, but the ones you really liked. You probably had a desire to want to please them, to find out what would make them happy. If you've ever dated anybody, if you've ever, uh, you know, gotten married, then there's this sense in which this, they call it the honeymoon period, and the hope is that when God is Lord of your marriage, that the the honeymoon period continues through on, even though there's an ebb and flow of it sometimes, that there are times when it wasn't one of these things where you were waiting for your spouse to say, I wonder what pleases you. You studied your spouse in order to figure out what it was that would please them. And then you kind of had the attitude of, your wish, which may just be a wish, but your wish is my command. Because it is my desire and my delight and my joy to want to please you. Now, the reason why I'm highlighting all of that is because the first 19 chapters of Exodus is God basically taking his people out of slavery and out of bondage and freeing them. If there's a person who I don't know very well at all that comes up to me and says, Stephen, I have some commands for you. We don't even use that word very much, do we? Commands? This is what I want you to do. You shall do this, and you shall do this, and you shall not do this, and you shall not do this. And I don't know you. I kind of go, say so what? Who are you to me? What kind of authority are you to me? Why should I obey your commands? But the Israelites are leaving a place in Egypt 
where people worship all kinds of other gods. But these are gods that people can't know in a personal way. So God says, I'm going to give you my personal name. You are going to have an in on knowing me more than anyone else will know me. And in fact, I am going to save you unconditionally before I give you any command at all. And now, because I have saved you out of the love relationship that I've already established with you, now I want to tell you how you can live to stay happy, to stay holy, to stay in my presence. It's a big difference, isn't it? At that point, it's not one of these things where you have a stranger or a big ogre type God in the sky that's telling you do this, do this, do this, do this because I don't want you to have any fun. Now it's a loving Father that says, this is what I'm calling you to. Not because I just have rules for you. I'm calling you to this because I long for a close relationship with you. And this is how that close relationship plays itself out. The other side of the coin, though, is that these ten commands are not ten suggestions. These are the ten commandments of God. He means what he says, and he's going to prove that he means what he says. And we live in a day and age where sometimes we have the attitude of, well, if I like it, I'll do it. If it makes sense, I'll do it. If it works for me, I'll do it. If it's giving me some advantage, then I'll do it. And God says, no, you do this because I am God. Period. And that would be enough. Now he also says, you do this because I am the God who redeemed you and saved you and loves you. But just because he's God, that's enough. And we need to start from that authority level as well. Okay. That was the long intro to something that I feel not very equipped to preach at all today. So y'all can pray for me as we hear the word today. This is God's word to us, starting in Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Here we go. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth, the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. 
You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to hear well what it is that you would want us to see in your word today. We thank you for the way in which Christ has come to rescue us and give us power to obey the law. But Lord, I know there are those who do not know yet Christ's rescue I pray that today you would make it become real to them by the power of your Holy Spirit and that we would all be reminded of it today. I pray you'd hide me behind your cross. I need you, God, to speak through me. People don't need to hear from me. We all need to hear from you. So I ask that you perform a miracle in our midst today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think it's called bending someone's ear. I hope I don't do that to you today. But have you ever had somebody do that to you before? Or have you ever done that to somebody? You ever thought, man, I think I just talked too much. Or you say, man, I I need to steer away from them because they talk way too much. And what I thought would be a one-minute conversation turns into a ten-minute conversation. I need to steer away from them. Sometimes we as people do talk too much. We have selfish ambitions for some of the things that we say sometimes. But what about God? Does God talk too much? I mean, after all, this is a big book, isn't it? There's all kinds of words in this book. I listened to an audio Bible and I started with Exodus 19 last night and I went all the way through Exodus 23 and I think my mind wandered at least 10 times and I was really trying to focus. So I didn't read Exodus 19 through 23 to you guys. But even in Exodus 21 through 17, even just the hearing of God's Word reminds us of our sin and reminds us of our need to be more in tune to what God has to say to us. Here's the beauty of what God does. God tells Moses to go up on a mountain. And it says in 20 verse 1, God spoke all these words. There are some people that you and I are tempted to listen to more than others. And then there are people that we tend to have selective hearing with, right? God has a deep desire to have our undivided attention when we pick up his word. It all relates to the first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. I was in an office building one time, and it's a, it's a great application. As you walk into this one guy's office, he has some kind of basket thing, and you know what it's for? Put your cell phones in the basket before you go in. Undivided attention is extremely challenging in today's world, right? We have all kinds of media and technology, and if you tend to like bounce from one thing to another thing to another thing, which is kind of sometimes the way my mind works, then it even gets to be harder. God says, I am speaking, and I want you to listen. I want you to give me your undivided attention. 
Why don't we give God our undivided attention? I think sometimes it's because we forget who God is. I mean, you think about it. Say that the President of the United States or your favorite sports hero or your favorite movie star or your favorite, you know, whatever comes or, or calls you or comes and visits you, you know who that is. So there's a certain level of, and, and I, I mean, I almost stuck my tongue out, but I'm like, you guys don't want to see my tongue. But there's this almost this, whoa, I'm in awe of your presence because you're someone great. And we, we get that. Brett Hull was one of my heroes growing up, St. Louis Blues hockey player. And, and I, I stood in a line in a Target and all in one year, and I think Matt Phelps was standing in that line too, and I stood for like three, four hours, and I loved the guy so much, didn't even know the guy, I was willing to stay like two days in line just to be able to shake his hand and have him sign some magazine that he was on the cover of and bit in hockey card. That was and I didn't want to wash my hand, you know. I don't think I did wash my hand for several days after I shook Brett Hall's hand because there was some, like, wow factor to it. And who ought to have more of an awe factor than the creator and sustainer, God? of all things. We are much more messed up than we would ever be willing to admit or have courage to say out loud. The Bible talks about how there is some miracle that takes place when God's people gather together in God's name to hear God's Word accompanied by the Spirit of God and that there ought to be this certain level of awe. Now, I had one of those mornings this morning where nothing was really working well. So what happened? Did I enter this sanctuary with this sense of awe? Did I come close to experiencing the same level of awe that I did when I met Brett Hull? No. No. And there's a good chance maybe neither did you. But here's the amazing thing. God ain't done working yet. And God's goal, objective, and will is to get us all to the point that before we leave, we have an amazing sense of the awe of God. That He is our God. That we are His people that just like he redeemed Israel from Egypt, Egyptian slavery, he has redeemed us from the slavery of sin and self and Satan. And that is good news. And God has a deep desire to want us to get there. Every single one of these commandments glorify him, but they're also for our good. Okay? It's like this, Yes, you can have your cake and eat it too. This is a both and. These things glorify God and they also bring good things to us. This is not an either or of I'm going to obey God, but I'm going to be miserable. No, this is a both and. Obeying God leads to joy. And disobeying God leads to pain and misery. So God gives us ways in which we understand what it means to obey Him so that we will have joy. Holiness is kind of a a weird thing. We understand that God's holy, but then we don't often think that it's very fun for us to be holy. We kind of like to see sometimes how much we can get away with and still sort of kind of, you know, kind of obey. And God loves us so much to tell us, no, no. You guys, you don't get it. Happiness, true happiness, is the byproduct of holiness. And without holiness, there is no happiness. And the only way holiness takes place is to walk with God. Jesus said, if you love me, 
you will obey my commandments. Okay, so let's, let's maybe say it this way. God's after our hearts. He is a father who deeply desires a restored relationship with his children. And he does a number of things to go after it. So another way maybe to explain it would be that love is the root and obedience is the fruit. Okay? So we obey and it's a motivation out of love. He wants to transform our hearts to get us here. All right. We'll see how far we get today. I promise I won't keep you here forever, but we haven't started yet on the commandments. (laughs) Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. God uses an individual word for you here. A lot of times, uh, American Christianity is focused too much on me, myself, and I, and God, and a personal relationship with Jesus, and not the corporate relationship. But in this command, God's actually talking about personal. God is highlighting individuals and saying, you and then fill in whatever your name is. You shall have no other gods before me. Why would he do that? I think there's this this power of the personal touch, okay? I I love to to meet with people like this, but I love to have one-on-one coffees with people too, or milkshakes or whatever. There's a sense of this one-on-one where God actually is taking every single one of his people, even though he's saying this on a mountain and there's six million plus Israelites there, he uses a you singular and say, you personally shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Does that mean that God just has to be the top God, but then we can have another God and another God and another God and another God? No. And it goes on in the second command to say, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What he's saying in the first command is, I want to be your number one priority. And not only do I want to be your number one priority, but I command that you make me your number one priority. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You know why sometimes I don't make God type priority in my life? Because I think I got all these other things that I got to do. So I don't really have time to make God my top priority. The crazy thing is, Jesus just promised, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things that you're worried about, they're going to fall into place. But if you don't make me top priority, yeah, then it's, your, your life's going to begin to spin out of control. There's also this before me, which sometimes is used in a spatial sense. So if you're looking across the table to someone else, God is saying, I don't want anyone to get in the way of our ability to see each other. I don't want any other thing to fail to cause us not to be able to establish eye contact with one another and see each other's facial expressions. Now, he's like, wait a second, Stephen, God's a spirit. You can't, like, have pizza with God like you can a friend. How's that work? God is spirit. But God has promised to put his spirit in those who see Jesus Christ as his son and savior and rescuer and Lord. And something mysterious and miraculous takes place when the spirit of God lives in us we do without even seeing the face of god can sense his facial expressions we can sense his body language 
we know when we have grieved him. We know when we have broken his heart. And God has said, hey, you just keep your eyes locked with me and locked with my spirit and I'll equip and empower you. And you'll know my heart in a special way. What's that look like practically? I didn't like this, but I read in a book last night and said that when you wake up, you have a decision to go to this, to go to a shower, or to vocalize a prayer. And if you go to this first, or if you go to the shower first, and this isn't me, this is something I read. I'm saying that because it convicts me, because I more often go to this or go to the shower. You go to God. And you said, God, you woke me up this morning. This is your day. I am yours. I don't want any other God to stand in the way of my relationship with you. So you're first. How else does it play out? If you're wondering, is God first? Ask yourself this question. What do you think about when your mind has freedom to think about whatever? Enter command number two. The Bible says we should not make any idols. Um, and it emphasizes that you can make them out of wood, you can make them out of stone, you can make them out of precious metal. And if we just look at the letter of the law, then we look at those things and most of us probably say, yes, I've never done that. I've never made a God out of wood or stone or precious metal. But we have worshipped other gods. And really, the three most popular in every single culture, including this culture, when you're talking about idolatry, is gods of money, sex, and power. Those three things tend to be things that we just gravitate toward in profound ways. And it is unique and I think a continual message that we can look at United States currency and read on it, and God we trust, but as soon as we begin to see our money disappear, we are exposed for what we really trust in, depending on how that affects us. The Bible says some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. Some trust in bank accounts, some trust in health, some trust in fill in the blank. But Psalm 20 verse 7 ends, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Now, how does that play out? And how do we know if we're worshiping other idols? Imagine, I had a great conversation with a friend back in August, and I can <clears throat> almost remember it word for word, where he talked about seeking contentment. And he said, you know, if I get to a place where every single thing could be totally stripped away from me, but I know that God never will, and I'm okay, not that I'm not heartbroken, but I'm okay, then I, then I think I'm okay. And here's the crazy thing about some things that God does. When we begin to go after other gods, you know what God often does? He goes to war against the gods we go after. And He will actually strip all those other gods that we thought we were worshiping. And we thought we were really worshiping God sometimes, but He'll take those things away to bring us back to a bare bones, my trust and hope is in you and you alone. Sometimes we can worship bad gods, gods that you can look at and say, everyone knows that this is a pathway towards self-destruction. And other times we can worship good things, but if we worship them, then they'll get bad like children, like a spouse, like a job, like ministry. 
had to wrestle with this one personally. What would happen if I wasn't the pastor of the bridge anymore? I really like being your pastor, guys. But I've had to wrestle with, what if that was taken away? Would I be okay? Would I curse God? Would I be angry with God? Or would I say like Job did, blessed is the God who gives, blessed is the God who takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's how we do inventory through all of this, is to say, God, am I trusting and worshiping you and you alone? Are you enough? Not that your blessings aren't amazing, but are you enough? We'll discover God is more than enough, but sometimes we don't remember that God is all we need until God is all we have. And God is willing to love us so much to get us there. All right, we need to go a little faster probably, right? Number three, you shall not, verse seven, take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's pretty cool to be able to name a kid. It was a lot of fun. My wife was very gracious and kind with me and giving me a lot of way in when we named our children. God is the only one who was not named by someone else. He was there before everything. And I get this question all the time in religion class. Um, who made God? What was there before God? And it's crazy because we all know the answer, but we're never fully satisfied with the answer. It's like, well, God was always there. There was never anything before God. I think we're not satisfied with the answer because it causes us to know that God has the upper hand on us. That God is carrying the ace of spades with him, okay? He has all power. And we want to say, well, if he has a beginning, then I can kind of compare myself to God. He doesn't have a beginning. Some people have put this don't blaspheme the Lord's name into too small of a box. And they say, well, as long as I avoid saying Jesus Christ in anger or GD it, then I'm okay. And I've obeyed this command. Now, saying Jesus Christ in anger or GD it definitely violates this command. Okay, let's be clear on that. That's not good. But it's a whole lot bigger than just that. God wants our minds and our hearts to be engaged whenever we talk about God, about his word, about God's people. He does not want any careless word to come out of our mouth when we're thinking along those lines. So even the, the flippant, um, and, and this, okay, this is probably me being a little bit judgmental, but I was at a worship service one time at a different church several years ago, and the preacher had a good sermon, okay? But there was this guy that was saying, and I'm okay with amens and all that stuff, okay? But do it at the right, like, there was this guy saying amen after every single sentence that this preacher preached. And I'm like, okay, really? Like when God moves you and, and you feel the amen coming out or you feel the hallelujah or you feel the praise the Lord, then by all means, do not quench the spirit of God and let it out. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but at the same time, We've got to be moved in such a way to where it's not one of these things where we just kind of get into this God talk or this Christianese where it becomes kind of a mindless thing. Not every single word is going to hit every single person the same way. So we shouldn't just take God's name and say, wait, wait, God's name is, is sacred. Jesus taught us how to pray and said, how will be your name? Our Father who art in heaven, how will be your name? Your name is sacred. Your name matters. And it kind of begins to make sense because when we hear our given name communicated by someone in a loving way, 
it has an effect on us. It also has an effect on us when we hear our name communicated in an angry way too, right? And it's one of these things where at what level am I valuing the name of God and recognizing God is, he's other. He's, he's transcendent now. He's chosen to, to come near, but he's way up there and he's chosen to come near. But every time I say his name, it's not this magical cantation. I'm speaking to a God who has a personality, who, who has feelings, who is, is loved and says, I, I want my name to be respected and admired and cherished. Here's the other interesting thing. We were born into Adam. Okay, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and we're sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. And Jesus is described in the New Testament as the second Adam. And the Bible seems to indicate that when Jesus died on the cross, he crucified the sin of the first Adam. And then when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So if you are a believer and you blaspheme God's name, you are blaspheming the very name now that you too have been baptized into. It's sort of like shooting yourself in the foot. Or maybe the head. Okay? So there's this sense in which not only does God deserve all respect, but we have been given the privilege of bearing that name as his ambassadors as well. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I taught this to kids with motions, and number four was come to church, and you do kind of this motion sign, and, and I realized, boy, this is so small. This is just one part of remembering the Sabbath in order to keep it holy. And then there's a command in verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work. Here's this crazy thing about God. God commands us to rest, but in the same command, he commands us to work. And we don't need a show of hands here. I just ask the question, how many of you like your job? And you know, it, it, all right, and, and that's awesome. Some people already, their hands went up, which means they really like their job. And that's a blessing. But if you don't like your job, pray that God will bless you with a job that you like, but also pray that God will not cause you to fall into what society thinks about Monday. Okay? Because most of our society says, oh gee, here comes Monday morning, I can't stand this. How is that glorifying to God? The Bible seems to indicate that both rest and work are sacred and to be valued and to be cherished. And not to say you're never going to have a bad day because we all know we will have bad days. But there is this sense in which God wants us to see our work and our vocation and our calling in a way that gives Him glory. And if you're saying, oh, here comes Monday morning, you need to confess to God, God, I do not have the right attitude right now. Would you please change it? And while you're at it, if you would change my job, change my situation. So you're either going to change me or change my job or maybe both okay? And God honors those things, okay? Because he wants us to walk with them and have the right attitude about work. All right, that's the work part of the command. What about the rest part? Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now, the Jews got a little carried away on this, okay? And there was a number of steps that they could walk. And after they walked that many steps on the Sabbath day, then they were kind of stuck. Or they broke the Sabbath, okay? 
And I think that you can't stand for too long either. So even if you just stay there and you stand until the next day, you've broken the Sabbath because you're standing. You're doing the work of standing. But then if you walk, you're breaking the Sabbath. And, and you, so they totally messed it up. So Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, the Sabbath is supposed to be good for you, not bad. So let's not get legalistic and silly about the Sabbath. But my experience is most people in America have gone to the other extreme where they say, well, I'm honoring the Sabbath as long as I'm going to church. So good job, guys. You'll honor the Sabbath. You're in church today. But it's more than that. Much more than that. The Bible has made us in such a way where one-third of our entire life we're asleep. The Bible begins in the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2. Not as saying there was morning and evening the first day. That's the way we start our day, right? When we get up in the morning, that's the start of our day. Not the way God does it. God says there was evening and morning the first day. What's God saying in that? He's saying, I think, guess what? When you sleep, I'm still at work. And I do not want you to rest from your work. I want you to work from your rest. And your Monday through Saturday will be a mess, or whatever day, because I can't really count today as a Sabbath for me. Whatever day you rest, your work should be energized through your rest. Have you ever, like, worked, like, a ton? Yes, because we're Americans, right? We tend to be workaholics, and you'll discover that the more that you work, <clears throat> the less energy you have, the worse the quality of the work that you're turning in is, and the worse your whole perspective on everything gets. So God has said, guess what, guys? I've made you and wired you in such a way to where every seventh day, you need to reserve as sacred. And you need to re-energize your soul on this day. And as you charge your soul, then Monday through Saturday, you're going to have spirit-filled, spirit-led power to work. Now, what's that mean? Some people have to work on Sunday, okay? But then figure out how to do it a different day. It does matter. And there's a promise connected with it. Hold on, not a promise. There's a, there's a reasoning behind it. And there's also a sense in which you're saying your servants, don't let your servants honor the Sabbath also. People that work for you, people that are entrusted to your care, make sure that you're taking care of them and loving them well enough to have opportunity for them to recharge their batteries also. There's a lot more that can be said on every single one of these. We need to move on. Number five, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The short answer to this is most parents have said, don't go play in the road. And if you don't go play in the road, you have a much better chance of living longer than if you go play in the road. But there is something more here where if we can't honor the authority figures that God has given to us, and namely our parents, how can we honor God who is the primary authority figure in our lives? So struggles with parents, though things kind of evolve and change as children grow into adulthood. But major struggles with parents can sometimes mean that the connection that you have with God is a bit off as well. You just, just need to pray through that. Number 13. Number 13, sorry. Number 6, Exodus 20, verse 13. All right, we're nearing the end here. Somebody didn't observe Sabbath this past week. You shall not murder. 
This is the one that most people go, yes, I haven't done this one. Until you read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, if you have hate in your heart, you are guilty of murdering that person in your heart. To which most of us go, oh, bummer, I'm guilty of that one too. There's an interesting dynamic about where John points to when you say that you love God, but you do not love your fellow man that has been made in God's image. You are a liar, and the truth of God is not in you. If you harbor extreme hatred toward other people, I'm just going to go out and say it, you need to question whether or not you're a Christian. I'm serious, guys. If you harbor extreme hatred, extreme, not saying you struggle with it and you repent and you ask God for grace and mercy, but you harbor extreme hatred toward another person and you're okay with it, that you've allowed your heart to get so hard that you hate that person and you're just good to continue hating that person, you need to question whether you're a Christian. Because here's what happens. God will go to war against that hatred because he knows that that hatred not only affects your relationship with the other person, it affects your relationship with God. And he doesn't like that. So he will go to war on your heart to help you to confess that hatred and to help you to be saved by it. Okay? But it is a serious thing. Next one. You shall not commit adultery. On this, there's a lot of people that take the letter of the law as well and say, okay, I have never slept with someone that's not my spouse, therefore I'm good. So you read the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, I tell you, if you've looked with lust at someone that's not your spouse, you are guilty of committing adultery with them in your heart. Sexual immorality is a sin that the church is often far too quiet about, that the church is losing a great deal of ground on, that wreaks incredible havoc on your soul and on your heart. It is equivalent to drinking spiritual cyanide and thinking that you're going to be okay. And there's all kinds of ways this plays out. The internet has made it a much bigger issue this is huge. Whether there's hatred or whether there's lust and sexual immorality, whether there's stealing, I'm going real fast now, or lying or coveting, it is not hopeless. There is hope and there is forgiveness because there is one who can to show you two things. He gave you this law. God gave you this law to show you you can never keep the law. The law is made so that you may understand you can never save yourself. You can never become acceptable to God on your own. So we need help, right? Where's the help come in? The thing that I don't understand about God, but I love about him, is that while we were still sinners, while we were breaking every single one of these commands and these laws, Christ died in our place. So what Jesus does is Jesus comes in and says, I know you can't. I can. I did. And it's done. Now, some people say, 
well, if you say that, then everybody's going to go around and just break all the laws because Jesus says, you can't, so then you say, oh, good, I can't, so it doesn't matter. Now, if that's your attitude, then you don't know Jesus and you don't love Jesus. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And here is the work that Jesus says is what the Father's looking for. The work that Jesus says the Father is looking for is for you to believe and put your wholehearted trust in the only one that fulfilled the law. Are we called to work for our salvation? Yes and no. Not our works, but we do the work of believing in the one who completed the finished work perfectly. What do you have to do in order to do that? First thing you have to do is realize you can't obey the law. That's a real hurt to our ego, isn't it? We're the can-do people, right? We like to be able to, we can do anything and everything. First step of salvation is saying, I am a sinner. I have broken these laws. I have broken these rules and I can never, ever save myself. Second part of salvation is God swooping down and saying, you're right, but here's the good news of great joy for all people. My son, Jesus, did what you could never do. Trust in him. And guess what, guys? When we begin to trust in him, something miraculous happens. The people that we used to hate so much, we don't hate quite as much. The struggles that we had with telling the truth and stealing and coveting, they they kind of begin to go away a bit because we're amazed at Jesus and we're centering in on his eyes and we're looking at him final song we're going to sing today is Amazing Grace. My chains are gone. John Newton wrote this song. And John Newton was a slave. Uh, he, was a, he was a ship. He wasn't a slave. He sold slaves. He took a ship to Africa and grabbed people and sold them. And God opened his eyes to the sin that was in his heart and saved him radically. And he was friends with a guy named William Wilberforce who helped abolish slavery in England. And I think this was a conversation that John Newton had when he was an old man who eventually lost his sight with William Wilberforce. And he said that he's learned two things from God. The first thing, I am a great sinner. The second thing, Jesus is a greater Savior. It is our hope at the bridge that this law would not become a, a duty, but would actually be transformed to become our delight because we know the one who totally fulfilled the law and gives us power to do it. But it will only become that when we recognize we are great sinners. But Jesus is a greater Savior, and he has made us worthy. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would impart these ancient words to us in a way that causes us to love you and walk with you. Lord, I pray that those who uh, were pricked and convicted by your word today may know that uh, there is hope at the foot of your cross and that you make us acceptable by your grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is pretty clear that every time that the gospel is communicated, every time that God's word is proclaimed, that uh, it calls for a response. It doesn't call us just to kind of twiddle our thumbs and say, okay, that was nice, kind of like we might to the news. You can say that about the news. 
it calls for some action on our part. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as you've heard these Ten Commandments, the last few rather quickly, there may be one that God has really put on your heart. There may be a person that God's just kind of shined His Holy Spirit flashlight on and said, you have extreme hatred toward this other person. And if God's shown you that, that is God going to war. Not against you. Against the sin that keeps you away from Him. Let him declare war. He always wins the wars he declares. And it will be for your good. There's a number of other commands that we touched on. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit does. I just know he always does what's right and perfect. But I'm going to encourage you to be sensitive to what it is that God's saying to you. And that as we proclaim about this amazing grace, that we may proclaim it with hope today, knowing that the amazing grace that first saved us is the amazing grace that will save us from sin even now and the sin that God has shown us about. Let's stand, let's sing amazing grace, and let's say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you tell me to do. You are
day. We will experience the fulfillment and completion of the mission that God has seen fit to accomplish. God is our great missionary God. And his mission is to bring us all the way home. So God told Israel, I am the Lord, your God. Obey me. And we here on earth will always struggle with this tension of wanting to obey but coming up short. But one day, the trumpet will sound and God will turn to His Son and give Him a head nod and say, go get my children. And the Bible says we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And in that twinkling of an eye, our heart's intention will be to totally and fully obey. And we will experience the reality of God being our God and we being His people. And He will forever and always dwell in our midst. Until that great day, may we hear these words of benediction from Jesus as He sends us out. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Father, may we receive your Holy Spirit. And just as you sent the Son, and the Son sends us with the Spirit, May we desire and delight in doing your will so that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for grace. And thank you, God, that you save us for your glory and for our good. It's in your name, Jesus, the name, the only name that saves, we pray. Amen. Amen. God be with you as you go.